They say, the harder the work, the greater the reward. This is our life's work. Good morning. It is 924 Wednesday, August 10th. This is the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the associate editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. And I was up until 2 a.m. last night covering the sale. So if I fall asleep during the show, during one of Bill's Red Sox monologues, or one of John's stump speeches to get on the latest board, it's not because I'm bored of their, their talking. It's just, you know. Uh, Joe, good morning. I'm Bill Finley, a correspondent with Thoroughbred Daily News. And Yes, you nailed it. I'm ready to talk Red Sox. Don't fall asleep. Now, here's why. Seth Clareman, are you watching this? I sure hope so or are viewing it. You guys probably don't know Seth Clareman owns a little piece of the Red Sox. Red Sox are a clown show, an absolute disgrace, an absolute fiasco. They won't spend any money to get new players. They traded away a beloved catcher for a broken fungo bat. The Fans are I right, Seth, you got to do something. You got to tell these owners, shut up, John. You got to tell these owners, shut up figuratively or whatever. You got to tell these owners, start spending some goddamn money. Thank you, Seth. That rant brought to you by <laughs> Jonathan Nyquil. Green. John, <laughs> but Joe, but brought to you by Nyquil. By Nyquil, exactly. Thank you. Um, Jonathan Green, general manager of DJ Stable. And don't change your, your computer settings. Yes, I did shave, and it was primarily because my Q rating was so high in comparison to you guys. I had to get it. I had to, like, dumb it down a little bit. So we're going with this for the for the time being. I thought it was because your beard wasn't talking to your hair. It was gray, and your hair is black. I thought that was why. It was a little incongruous. No no question about it. I, I got to get the uh, – I'm going to have to get the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the coloring. Uh, Just stick. for men. Just for just men, for just like yep. just like Bill does for his hair. I got to get it for my for my beard. So anyway, that's that's it for the show. Thank you for joining us at the uh, Writers Room Insult uh, Comedy Hour. <laughs> <laughs> the TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland, home of the world's yearling sale. Make plans to attend the Keeneland September yearling sale beginning Monday, September twelfth. Catalog is now available at the world's yearling sale dot com. Okay, so we're going to do a little combo week in review segment here with some of the racing and some of the sales news because there's a lot to talk about on both fronts. We'll start with the Whitney. That was the big race of the weekend, and that was the big showdown that we were expecting between Life is Good and Olympiad. Never really materialized because Olympiad did not show up and was a well-beaten fourth. I was on on better things last week. I picked against him just because I thought that he was going to get – you know, we get a little tired trying to chase life is good early. It's just so it's it's dangerous for horses, not physically dangerous, but just in terms of winning a race for horses who are usually kind of used to pressing the pace. And Olympiad has had the same trip every single time this year. They're used to chasing horses from the, from the two path, you know, close second to try to chase horses that have that runaway speed. And man, does life is good to have runaway speed. I just saw a great quote from Irad Ortiz that two jumps. He just took off down the back stretch. Looked like they were going to try to control the pace early. And then it was just, I'm going, you know, catch me if you can. And they almost did. Happy Saver and Hot Rod Charlie, especially, I thought ran really good races to be second and third. Todd Pletcher, exacta. But life is good in the end. It was too fast. There was a little controversy about Irad's ride. You know, life is good likes to meander as it is. And Irad helped him along by jerking him to the inside into Happy Saver's path. I don't think that was particularly dangerous or anything. I think he was clear. But listen, Life is Good is one of the fastest horses we've seen in years. But does he want to go mile and a quarter? That's the main question. And it just seems like a mile and eighth is the absolute max that he wants to go. What do you guys think? Uh, Joe, um, I guess I'm a little bit in the minority here because, you know, what I'm reading on social media, what people react otherwise. I was not super impressed by his race. And now, and and this is unfair, but I think I've been spoiled by Jackie's Warrior and Flightline and some of these just absolutely brilliant performances we've seen this year, even Epicenter in the Jim Dandy. Yeah, he won. He looked good, but he didn't take your breath away. He didn't blow you away. And also keep in mind, if, you know, with Olympiad just not showing up, you know, what was the competition behind him? You know, American Revolution was scratched. Happy Saver just keeps running second all the time. Midnight uh, Hot Rod Charlie's a good horse, but you know, not up, not up to that. So you know, he he won. It was never really in doubt, but he just he didn't wow me in this. And I think you hit the nail on the head. I think one of the reasons why is going the mile and eighth is his absolute limit. 
And, you know, if the race were seven furlongs or a mile, I think he would have looked a lot differently. And I wrote in Week in Review, I mean, obviously, they're going to go to the Breeders' Cup Classic. I understand that. But right now, at a mile and a quarter, and the key being that distance, a mile and a quarter against the likes of Flightline and some others are going to show up, I think you'll have a hard chance, uh, a tough chance of winning that race. I really do. And, you know, that's not taking anything away from him. He's a tremendous horse. He's going to be a very valuable and likely successful sire. You know, he's checked a lot of boxes. He won the Whitney. I mean, the Whitney's a great race. But, you know, I think going forward, you know, uh, they say they might run him in the Woodward at Aqueduct. That's a mile and eighth. That's fine. We'll see what happens. But, you know, I don't know. I, I was a little bit underwhelmed. I think I, I agree with you guys as far as, you know, the underwhelmment part um, and, and a little disappointed, especially when you look at the time When you look at the winning time of, uh, you know, of, of, of almost 149. Um, the track record is 146 and change. You know, so they were they really weren't from a stopwatch standpoint. They weren't impressive um, from an eyeball test. I thought life is good was really impressive for the first eight furlongs. And then, you know, he kind of wrapped up, you know, I, um, I wrapped up on him a little bit, did his little, you know, Jim, you know, Jimmy shimmy down the down the stretch. And that didn't look good. Um, but, you know, I don't know if it was a if it was that the horse was getting tired or the horse, you know, was just getting disinterested or if Hot Rod Charlie and Happy Saver, especially who came up on the rail, um, were really, you know, eating up ground and catching up to life is good. Or if if everyone just thought, you know, I read and, and the horse life is good, just thought. This race is one. I'm just going to wrap it up and, and be done. But, you know, the 107 buyer actually is a bounce. And, and Joe, I'm going to be interested to hear what you have to say about this from a handicapping standpoint. But you look at a horse like Life is Good and, and yeah, nine furlongs is probably the, at, at a grade one level. Nine furlongs is probably the furthest that, that he can go. Um, and, he, and he showed that when he ran a, a, you know, kind of a, a disinterested fourth in the Dubai World Cup going a mile and a quarter. Just it's not his cup of tea. It's just not that good. But a 107 after posting 107 buyer after posting 112, 110, 109 respectively for his previous three races, it, it technically is a bounce if you think about it. And that's what it looked like on the eye test. It definitely looked like a bounce. Um, I also want to just, you know, focus a little bit on Happy Saber. Um, this poor son of a gun has run second now to Life is Good, Flight Line, Olympiad, and Maxfield in his past four races. I mean, other than Nick's go, I think we'd be hard pressed to find a handicap horse that's that's better than those four that Happy Saver just keeps being the, the bridesmaid to. I mean, this is a horse that tries every time and just isn't at that grade one winning level. But man, he just he's he just keeps getting put up against all these great horses um, and generational horses, you know, at least with flight line and, and life is good. And you can maybe make a case for Olympiad because he had won five races in a row coming into, uh, you know, five graded stake races in a row coming into uh, you know, into the Whitney. So it, it's, it, it was a small field. It wasn't a, you know, it wasn't a great eye popping, you know, watch to watch race, but I still think that we're going to see life is good. Happy saver, hot rod, Charlie and Olympia, the first four horses. Um, and even American revolution, the horse gets scratched. We're going to see all those horses, um, competing in the, in the classic. So I think we're going to look back at this Whitney and say, yeah, maybe it was a one-off, but it was still a grade one championship uh, race for life is good. And, and Bill, like you said before, he, he is a generational talent. I mean, he is just that good. And and last year we were all excited about Max, uh, you know, excuse me, Maxfield and, and Nick's go going head to head. This race coming up, the classic is setting up where there's four or five betting horses in the race that you think on on their best day could could you know be standing in the winner's circle. And Joe, I'd be interested to hear about about your bounce, about what you think about the bounce theory for Life is Good. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think Bill's being a little harsh. I think. The track had a lot to do with it because it got that midday rain. And I think the track slowed down and became a lot more tiring after they sealed it. I think you saw that a little bit in the test um, where Shy Town Lady came from absolutely nowhere to run down Matarea and uh, Hot Peppers. I, I, you know, I think on a faster track, I, I think Life is Good would have had a little bit more chance to have that brilliant blowout win that I think some people might have been expecting from him. But like John says, this was this was a legitimate grade one field. And I think you know one of the keys for for life is good is just how well he breaks. I mean, he you could not break better than he broke in that race. And if horses, I think if horses were like football players, and you could get them to watch tape, I think like traders would would tell their horses to you know, watch how life is good breaks because it's it, it's absolutely incredible and it's such an advantage because he has to expend so little energy to get to where he wants to be in a race, you know. And it's just every single time he's just rocket out of the gate, rocket out of the gate, and 
he really puts the pressure on other horses in the race, especially other speed horses, to be sent and to, to you know have to break well to keep up with him early. And I thought it was a great training job by Ty Pletcher too, because if you if you looked at his work tab on paper, it didn't look that special. Like four furlongs and forty eight and three, and like five furlongs and one hundred one. He wasn't you know blazing up the track like you see Bob Baffert horses do. But if you watch those works on XBTV. Those were like mile works. You know, the, the the gallop out was the part of the work. It was, you know, the the actual timed version was really just a warm up because he was galloping out like strong miles in that rate in that in those workouts. But you know, you have to have a horse, I think, who's willing to train like that and who's who's a forward trainer and really wants to get cut loose even in the mornings. And I, I, I think he's a remarkable horse, honestly. I do not want him the classic. You know, I I, I think he ran Pretty much the same race that he'll always run in a mile and an eight. So I don't think it was it was necessarily a bounce. I, I just think that's the apps that's the cap as far as how how far he wants to go. And that just reminds me of the, they have the Breeders' Cup Classic uh, Future Pool for the first time this year. Flightline is two to one, two to one on Flightline. What are we still three months from the race, which is just staggering to me. I'm curious, like what what Bill has to say about that because because like. You know, at best, at worst, he's going to be like six to five or seven to five in the classic. You know, if people show up. American Revolution, I was disappointed, scratched. He was my pick on better things. He's 32 to one in the Bruce Cup classic. You know, you just talk about the difference in value. You know, American Revolution is a way better value than Flightline. And we still got questions about Flightline, too. He's never been beyond a mile. My wife is good, has done it a mile and eighth now twice. Flightline has still never been beyond a mile. We expect him to cruise in the Pacific Classic, but we don't know that until he actually does it. And just one last thing I want to say uh, on the the Whitney before I wrap my thoughts is I got to give a hat tip to Hot Rod Charlie. He's just one of those horses who doesn't have a lot of wins on his resume due to bad luck and circumstances, but he shows up and tries every single time. You know, he's probably going to be a bit of a forgotten horse of this generation because he doesn't have all those wins. But I think he deserves a lot of credit and a lot of love for the heart that he has. You think about the Belmont when you read in that tremendous second to essential quality. You ran a good fourth in the classic last year, chasing Nick's go when nobody else wanted to. This was a tremendous effort to be third because he had to chase what was good and then make another bid at him on the far turn. I just wanted to give a little bit of love to Hot Rod Charlie, who I think is a super underrated horse. And Joe, he's been yeah, doing this the future wager. Oh, sorry, Bill. I was just going to say he's been... That's okay. Um, I mean, the future same with the Derby. It's a bad bet. I, I don't know why anybody bets it. Um, you know, two to one is a ridiculous price on Flightline, and I'm a huge Flightline fan. You know, first of all, you know, if the race will run tomorrow, I think you're right. It'd probably only be about six to five. So it's not like you're getting two to one on a one to five shot. And also, any horse is... What is the percentages they get sidelined between now and the Breeders' Cup time? And that's no reflection on... Uh, flight line or I'm saying he's on sound or anything like that. It's just, that's the nature of the game. Keep him healthy for another uh, two months is very difficult, but I want to throw the conversation back to John, because I think Joe, you're the one of the three of us that I don't think really touched on, you know, the germane topic here. Can you see this horse winning the Breeders' Cup Classic at that level of competition at a mile and a quarter? I can't. Yeah, Bill, I, I would agree with you. I, I would think that, that that's going to be just outside the scope of his abilities at the grade one level. If he was running it a mile and a quarter, um, you know, against grade three horses, absolutely. Sure. But, but not with this crop of, of, of you know, of, of older horses. I mean, this is really a unique year, I think. If, if all of them stay healthy, um, like we said before, there's going to be half a dozen horses that you can really make a legitimate case for. And there's going to be a horse that's going to jump up between now and, and the Breeders' Cup that's going to make us kind of pause and say, where was this horse before, you know, and, and kind of toiling in maybe some of these great three races and looking to, to step up, uh, you know, almost like, like Rich Strike did in the breeders in the, uh, excuse me, in the Kentucky Derby, where you go, this horse doesn't really belong. And all of a sudden after they win, you go, Hmm, maybe, maybe I should have looked a little closer at some of the, uh, some of the prep races, but as far as cementing life is good as a future stallion, there's no question that once he won the breeders cup mile and some of the, race, um, you know, results that he's put in, some of the performances he's put in cements him as a legitimate sire, um, you know, and, and he's probably, he's not going to stand for as much as Justify who won the Triple Crown, but I would venture to guess that even if he doesn't win the Breeders' Cup Classic, being a son of Into Mischief out of the out of the strong family that he has, strong female family, 
he's going to be a seventy-five to hundred thousand uh, dollar, you know, stallion, and he'll get booked up. You know, three hundred mares will, will will apply for him, um, especially when you look at how well some of these young sires like Justify and Gunrunner, how their progeny have done at the uh, at the sales. I mean, it, it's at a hundred thousand dollars. I hate to say it because it's a shit ton amount of money, but it's almost a bargain. <laughs> yeah, John, John is already selling those. Stallion shares, the life is good. That's out of boy. Um, you know, I, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, you know, he's he's obviously going to be a very attractive prospect. And just to wrap that up, I do think it's an interesting classic this year because I do think there are legitimate questions about him. And maybe Flightline will just win the Pacific Classic by fifteen lengths with a hundred thirty buyer, and will you know it'll be a foregone conclusion that he wins the Breeders' Cup if he gets there. But you know, until it happens, I yeah, you know, I, I think that it's a really interesting classic field looking at it now. And I, I think that there will be, there will be some chances in that race. Whereas last year I thought, I thought it was a little bit of a ho-hum field, even though the horses were pretty nice. I thought betting wise, it just wasn't really that interesting, but I just wanted to shift gears a little bit to the fireworks last night up in Saratoga, because, you know, especially with John here, I'm interested to, to get his thoughts. There were 10, 10 seven figure yearlings last night at the face of Saratoga sale and the, the sale, you know, smash records all over the place. And I, I, you know, especially we're going to talk about this a little later. We got a new sponsor and three chimneys about the, the, the continued explosion of success of gun runner. He had the topper in the entire sale for $2.3 million. So it's told, sold to the friends at cool more as well as Peter Brandt. Um, but you know, I, I hear a lot from people about like, Oh, well, there's a recession coming and we need a soft landing and all this and all that. Maybe that's right. But it seems to me like the 0.01% of the world are doing pretty well to be spending record breaking numbers at these horse sales. And, you know, last th this week's sale, it just, like I said, it, it shattered all the records. And I think it bodes well, of course, for Keeneland September, which is coming up now in just over a month. Keeneland September catalog came out yesterday, 4,147 yearlings cataloged. But John, I mean, what do you make of this? I felt like earlier in the year there was there was a lot of talk about you know a little bit of, of wariness in the market and whether or not there was going to be a recession coming. There was no sign of that this week in Saratoga. Yeah, and and Joe and, and Bill, one of the things I can tell you as, as as somebody that follows finances and 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 the horse industry, the the thoroughbred industry, especially the the sales industry, sales part of it, um, has always been a, a a laggard indicator. So in other words. If, if we're in a recession, if our recession technically started this quarter, the effects of it wouldn't be felt in the horse industry for six to nine months later. So that's why even if, if we're technically in a recession right now as, as an economy or as a country, you're not going to see that play out um, until probably next summer's yearling sales. Um, so it, it doesn't surprise me. Some of the things that did surprise me were you know, 14 horses that sold for over a million dollars. That just shows you that the cream of the crop is it, people are still chasing those horses. And of the $14 million yearlings, 13 different groups bought a horse. So it, it's, you know, it, Joe, if, if you want to say, well, maybe the recession's hitting a little bit in that sense. Yeah, it, it used to be where you had three or four of these guys getting together or, or buying individually on their own, these million dollar horses. But now it's almost like two people are gunning for one horse and one gets it. And then that person who didn't win goes to the next one for two. You know, there's two people that kind of run it up, you know, to, to a value that they see. Um, you don't see the multiple purchases like you used to. You are seeing more and more partnership purchases. Um, you know, our, our, our friends at West Point bought a couple of parts of a couple of horses that, you know, for over a million dollars. Same thing with with Magner. Um, and, and when you look at smart people in the industry like West Point and like Coolmore, you have to kind of sit and take notice that they are still buying expensive yearlings, expensive colts for the most part. Um, but West Point bought a, uh, you know, in partnership with Curlin Philly for $2 million. So, um, you know, for the most part, there was, there was the boys, but there were some fillies that sold for a lot of money. And again, you, you look at probably the most important indicator to me was that there was an 80% clearance rate. So that means 80% of the horses that went through the ring sold, um, which is just a phenomenal number, because that means that not only were the prices um, exceeding expectations, but that they were exceeding, you know, everyone's thoughts going into the sale as far as how much they'd be willing to keep their horse for. So when you have an 80% clearance rate um, at an overall sale, that's just a phenomenal, phenomenal number. So, you know, it looks like our industry 
at least at the top market, is very, very strong. That'll carry over, in my estimation, to book one and book two of Keeneland, which are coming up. Um, and then we'll see. Then we'll see the recession kind of start to seep in um, to, you know, to some of the lower priced horses. And you may see a lot of horses in book five or six uh, that don't sell or sell for very little because there just isn't that kind of follow up market. But the, the top of the market is exceedingly strong. You know, it was a wild sale because, you know, a lot of time, you know, we cover it at the TDN extensively, obviously. Usually like we get down to like the seven fifty, seven hundred thousand dollar horses. There were just so many million dollar horses that you you could sell a horse for eight hundred thousand last night and wouldn't even crack the paper because there were just so many seven figure yearlings selling. And I wonder if that, you know, maybe makes it not great value, John, because I don't know if you guys if you guys shop this sale at all, but it just it seems like the demand was just absolutely through the roof. And it's just so hard to believe, you know, just from a layman's perspective, watching racing, how many million dollar yearlings do you see become, you know, multiple grade one winners and stallion prospects? It just doesn't happen all that often. So I wonder what your thoughts are. If, if it, the demand blows everything out of the water so much that there, there becomes no value at, at these sales sometimes. What do you yeah, think, John? We we were not we didn't even yeah, Joe, we didn't even go to the Saratoga sale because we anticipated that the prices yeah. were going to be, you know, so far above normal. Now, we did not expect it to be this strong. Um, but that's one of the reasons why I'm in New Jersey versus in Saratoga this week. Um, we did sell a Philly, a distorted humor Philly at the uh the tail end of last night, again for almost twice as much as what we anticipated before when when she left Kentucky. So we were really pleased with that. I think people are also emboldened. A little bit about uh, with the success of Gamine and Flightline and Corniche, these seven-figure horses that are you know are, are super expensive horses that are having success on the racetrack. It used to be where other than you know other than a handful of times, these seven-figure horses never really you know got to get that that level. They were worth the most when they went through the the sales ring that day. Um, but now you're starting to see some of these really expensive horses perform on the racetrack, and when they perform on the racetrack. They exponentially are worth so much more in the breeding shed down the road. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think flight line in particular is is an example of that because I still think overall 80, 90 percent horses above seven hundred thousand dollars don't become superstars and you don't make money on them. But yeah, I think having those high profile horses in the last couple of years who did you know do well and, and become valuable and, and maybe even more valuable than their purchase price, definitely in the case of flight line, I think does you're right, embolden people. Um, but yeah, it was it was crazy two nights in, in Saratoga. And like you said, that momentum is sure to carry over into Keeneland September in a, about a month's time. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Whitney winner, Life is Good, as a graduate of book one at the Keeneland September sale. Son of Inta Mischief was purchased $525,000 by China Horse Club and Maverick Racing in 2019. Grade two, Glens Falls winner. Forgot to mention her, but how about Warlike Goddess? Coming back and, and defending her title in the Glens Falls might go after the boys next. And the sword dancer Bill Mott mentioned, uh, she also went through the ring at the Keeneland September sale. Your next opportunity awaits at this year's Keeneland September sale, which starts Monday, September 12th. Catalog is now live and features 4,147 yearlings. Book one includes yearlings out of 89 graded stakes winners and 36 grade one winners, plus siblings to 50 grade one winners. So you can't beat that kind of quality and we're all looking forward to that sale and just over a month from now we'll be right back after this message from keeneland when the thoroughbred world descends upon lexington this november there is one place you need to be the place where history comes alive with every championship victory he's off the dick and deep. the place where the future is built with the fall of a gavel the place that exists to be the heart of this industry the center of it all. Home to the November breeding stock sale and 2022 Breeders' Cup, Keeneland. Spitestown. Bunning. Echo Town. It's Echo Town for Joe Talamo and Echo Town. Race the way. And Echo Town is drawing away in the stretch. Echo Town wins the Allen Turkin Stakes. A sire line so prolific, it repeats itself. Echo Town. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Coolmore. Ashford's Uncle Mo had the day one session topper at this week's basically 
Lexington Saratoga sale. The cult out of secret side brought $1.5 million selling to the friends of West Point. Woodford Racing and Partners, stud mate Justify had a yearling cult bring $1.1 million. Mendelssohn had his first TDN Rising Star on Sunday with Pink Hue. Looked very, very good for Chad Brown. Mendelssohn now has seven winners with five of those coming in the past two weeks, including two at Saratoga. So he's really starting to catch fire with his first crop. Congratulations as well to everybody at Coolmore for Golden Pal's latest win at the Spa and the Grade 3 Troy Stakes. Future Coolmore Stallion and son of current Ashford resident Uncle Mo was winning his seventh career race and second of the year after his Shaker Town win in April. Cut, I read cut it a little bit close in that race. Sure, had a lot of people sweating, especially with the horse being one to five. But it was great to see Golden Pal back on these shores. Hope he stays in America the rest of, of, of this year and, and see him hopefully repeat that his feet in the Breeders' Cup turf sprint. It would be his third Breeders' Cup run in a row which not i don't i don't know if any horses have accomplished that it's off the top of my head but yeah great to see golden pal back on the track as well and coolmore of course very busy last night in saratoga as well all right so we're gonna we're gonna stand up for our fellow media members here this is a big story this week i'm, I'm gonna leave it mostly to, to bill here john said he wasn't gonna say anything but he always says that and then he comes in and, and talks for like five minutes so I won't hold my breath on that one. But it was a it was a, a big story in this in the past week that the uh, the California Horse Racing Board now is is trying to institute a rule that uh, media members have to be licensed to go onto the back stretches of California tracks. You have to pay a seventy five dollar fee. You got to get fingerprinted. You got to get a background check done, which is obviously ridiculous and and you know spells bad things for racing and, and the way racing media is allowed to cover the sport. I saw some people suggesting that this was a, a Heiser thing, which, I mean, obviously I haven't read the Heiser regulations top to bottom, but why would, A, why would CHRB not mention that in their press release? And B, why wouldn't other tracks also be announcing similar policies if this was a Heiser thing? Obviously, this is this is ridiculous. And the most worrying part, I think, that some people have brought up is that this could lead, lead to uh, the CHRB and California tracks being more easily able to revoke credentials. And at a time when the sport, if anything, needs more scrutiny, and that's part of the reason we do this show, is that the sport needs scrutiny like it's never had before because of you know all, all the messiness going on in, in the last decade, especially. It's just it, it's the exact opposite way that people who run racetracks and run racing jurisdictions should be acting. And, and it just, it, it's never good when media is, the people try to restrict media in any sport. And, you know, uh, this has failed. This kind of policy has failed in other major sports. And I, I, I think it's doomed to fail in racing because of the big uproar that has come out of this. And it just, I, I, I would love to hear the California Horse Racing Board really ex explain themselves as to why this was necessary. Bill? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is some serious Big Brother stuff here. And, you know, the, so many points we made. The first one is why? Who saw the need for this? You know, did something happen that we don't know about? You know, why did the California Horse Racing Board, after all this time and all these years, where since the beginning of time, credentials are handled by the racetracks, decide to come in and say, no, you've got to get a license from us. And, you know, this this creates so many problems. And first of all, you know, this just flies in the face of the First Amendment and freedom of speech. And, you know, again, wh why was this necessary? The fee for the license is only $75, but it doesn't matter if it's $75 or $750 or $1. You can't have the media having to pay money for essentially the right to do their job. And, and Joe, you, you really hit the nail on the head. But the biggest issue here is that, you know, now that if a media person is going to be licensed, they're under the um, control of CHRB, just like if John Green gets an owner's license out in California. So clearly they have the right to find somebody, to suspend somebody. And, you know, suppose somebody writes a story that the CHRB is a bunch of buffoons or, and, and they did this all wrong. Are they going to suspend their license? I mean, you hope that they won't, but just the fact that they have that power or could have that power to do something like that. Yeah. I mean, you know, we talk about un-American. That just flies in the face of everything that, you know, we, we, we know and love about our country and how, you know, the First Amendment and, 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 and the rights of the media and the press. Here's another problem, too. Next year, the Breeders' Cup is at Santa Anita. You've got to have hundreds of journalists coming in from all over the world. 
You can ask some guy coming in from Japan to cover the Breeders' Cup. Oh, excuse me, Mr. So-and-so, before you can have cover the Breeders' Cup, you've got to come in at Santa Anita a week early and get fingerprinted to cover the race. I mean, it's just so outlandish and, and so unnecessary. Um, you know, the CHRB, hopefully they're listening to the blowback. Hopefully they'll understand that this was just not a good idea and they'll, you know, say, never mind. But on the surface right now, things it's, it's really, and, and one more point, horse racing is dying for more media coverage, particularly from the mainstream media. I mean, the day and age where the mainstream media pays attention to the sport are over, but maybe they would come out to the Breeders' Cup. So why are you going to do something to discourage mainstream media and the media as a whole from covering your event? I mean, nobody's saying to, um, you know, the New York Times, they've got to pay $100 to send their writers to the Super Bowl. That's exactly what it would be like. It, it, it just, it, it's, it's just unfathomable. It's nonsense. Yeah, I mean, it, it and it, I, I honestly think it's, I don't know what the motivation specifically was for this, but it, I think it's emblematic of kind of this, uh, this anti-press sentiment that that's bubbled up in the past five years or so, particularly because of Trump. Um, if you, there's a documentary recently that, that Ronan Farrow produced that's on HBO. I think it's called Endangered. And it's really worth watching and it's interesting and it, it covers, it follows four journalists, you know, around the world whose, whose ability to, to practice their craft and to, to cover things and scrutinize things is being threatened and, and sometimes physically with violence. Obviously, racing media, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't face even close to that level. Um, of pushback, but but the the concept is the same. That I think a lot of people feel feel comfortable comfortable and emboldened these days to have this you know very blanket like anti media anti press sentiments. The media is the enemy of the people and all that stuff. And I don't know that in a in a past time where that didn't really exist, at least on the surface, that CHRB would have been comfortable coming out with a policy like that. And I think, you know, kudos to the racing journalists who have made such a big stink about this. You know, I think of Jay Pribman and Teresa Gennaro and Jeremy Ballin. Like, I think, you know, we do have a lot of good reporters in this sport who are, you know, rightly, you know, drawing a line in the sand and saying, no way, this this is not going to stand. And yeah, I, you know, I think Bill makes, makes the correct points that this is a fundamental thing. This is a fundamental right of the press thing, a freedom of the press thing, where once once the the entity starts controlling who can come cover the sport, you know, and essentially who can say what if they're in charge of revoking licenses, then you no longer have freedom of the press. And Bill makes another great point that we should be begging people. We should be begging people to come to the track and cover the sport and give us a little bit of shine, especially now in California. You know, I, I think about this, too, because California and the CHRB definitely deserve some credit for this. All the good stories that have come out of California in the last couple of years with the vastly improved safety record and, and drug record. And there is a lot of good news to report on. And now is when you decide you're going to kick the media members out or at least make them pay for the privilege of covering the sport. It's just it's ass backwards in every single way. And I would just I would have loved to be been a fly on the wall in the CHRB's deliberations on whether or not they were going to do this and, and the statement they were going to put out, because it just it seems like there should have been one person with some common sense in, in the room that said, you know, guys, this might not look great. This might you know, even if you felt like, you know, this was a necessary step, you you would think about the optics and be like, you know, is it, is it really a good idea to be restricting media access on the backstretch at our tracks, especially when the sport is, you know, withering a little bit as it is. And it's, you know, especially when there have been so many stories worth covering in the last couple of years, it's just, it's, it's, it's mind boggling. And I, I hope that they, they backtrack on this. And I think people need to keep the pressure on them for sure. And I don't know whether that's, you know, boycotting covering the Pacific classic or, or Santa Anita or any of these things, but it's just someone, someone needs to, take a real about face on this and, and apologize, frankly, I think to, to racing and racing media, because this is, this is authoritarian stuff. And like Bill says, it doesn't matter. That's not about the price of the license. Like the license could be a dollar. It's a, it's the fact that the, now the CHRB is going to control who can cover their sport and then consequentially who can say what about their sport. And that, that should be unacceptable to everybody in America. So I, I agree with everything you guys are saying. Can I just be devil's advocate and ask you guys a question as, as media? When was the last, honestly, when was the last time either of you were on the backstretch of a racetrack? Yeah, but John, no, I mean, I, I'm sorry, we're not ahead, talking Bill. about Joe Bianca and Bill Finley. We're talking more about the people like Jay Pridman, the boots on the ground at these racetracks. So it, it doesn't matter if this effect, to me, it doesn't matter if this affects 
uh, 200 riders or three riders. It, it's, it's, it's the principle behind this. It, no, it doesn't affect me. I have no, there's no chance it, in between now and maybe next year's Breeders' Cup, and I even doubt that, that I'm showing up on the backstretch of a California track. But there are people that want to do that. And in particular, back, you know, let's take the San Diego paper there that maybe would come out opening day and Pacific Classic Day or something like that. You know, maybe now they just say, no, we're not going to do it. And, you know, how does that affect and impact the sport that, that is looking for all that kind of exposure? So, I mean, I don't think this is a Bill Finley and Joe Bianca issue by any stretch of the imagination, um, but it, it, it's a larger issue for, you know, while we may not be there, there are dozens of other people that need access to the backstretch at these racetracks. And, you know, they're still get it, but now they get it with a caveat or with a restriction placed, you know, on, on what they can and cannot do. And look, you know, the first, maybe, maybe the CHRB is more reasonable than we're giving them credit for, but, you know, let's take, you know, uh, writer X and he shows up and, you know, like I said, write something derogatory about the CHRB. How are they going to respond to that? You know, and and, yeah. and it's trending. It's one of the top ten stories on on Twitter right now, which is really surprising um, because obviously a lot of the media is picking it up. And guys, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't this like the second slap in the face of a racetrack or or a racing jurisdiction um, against riders? I remember when Arlington Park was closing. Didn't they like? Didn't they just kick everybody out of the of the press booth? Like they're like. Get out of here now! Like it wasn't. It wasn't. Even I mean, that was like more. I, I feel like that was like a more of a petty thing because you know everybody was was waxing poetic about the track closing. I thought that was like you know I don't think that was like a that wasn't like a policy. I think that was just one guy being a dick. Um, right. I, you know, I and to to your question, John, no, like I'm not on the back stretch all that often. Next time I'll be on the back stretch is to feed writers' room a peppermint this weekend at Saratoga. So no, it doesn't, it, it does, it doesn't affect me all that much, but it, it, it leads to the point. I think the, the, the logical conclusion of this is if people, fewer and fewer people start covering California racing because of this, then California racing can control the narrative and just put out press releases. And there'll be really no reporting other than what the CHRB decides is, you know, consumable for the public. And that's a terrible spot for anybody to be in, like that's that's you know I, that's what I always think about when people are like, oh, fake news and media is the enemy and blah blah blah. It's okay. It's like okay, so let's follow that. Do you want to get to the point where the leaders will just tell you what to think and tell you you know what they want you to 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 consume and believe? Like you don't want any kind of reporting whatsoever to get to the truth. You're just okay with the president saying, here's how it is. Here's what's happening. No questions, please. You're okay with that if you're one of these media is the enemy of the people. Yeah, you know, like it's just it blows my mind. Like it, just because people people are upset that like the media is like will report negative stories on a politician. They like they don't want any journalism anymore whatsoever. It's just daddy, tell me what to believe and I'll believe it. So that that's I like I said I think that's kind of undergirding this is that anti media sentiment that's going through the the, wor the the world and especially America right now. But I I, I think like I said there it's been good that there has been such fierce pushback about this in the racing media with a lot of good journalists speaking up about it. And I think CHRB will have to re reverse course eventually. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Horse Breeders Association. After late nominations for the first leg of the two-year-old PA Sired, PA Bread Series 44 nominations are in for the Whistle Pig Stakes and 53 for the Miss Blue Tie-Dye. The second leg of the series, which consists of two $200,000 stakes, will be run on Pennsylvania Derby Day at Parks, which is September 24th. Nominations close on September 6th. Pennsylvania Day at the Races is now less than two weeks away. On August 22nd at Parks, there'll be over a million dollars in purses with seven $100,000 stakes. If you own a PA bred or PA sired horse, you'd be silly not to show up on those two days. Definitely a good program that, that the PHBA runs, and, and we look forward to those races at Parks. We'll be right back after this message from the PHBA. The PA Horse Breeders Association introduces the Pennsylvania Stallion Series. Four brand new races to be run at parks for PA sired, PA bred two-year-olds. There are two $100,000 contests on August 22nd, PA Day at the Races. September 24th, PA Derby Day has two more races, each with a $200,000 purse. The PA Stallion Series, yet another reason why Pennsylvania is the premier place to breed and race. For more, please visit pabred.com.
The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. So we're thrilled to welcome on this week. We're thrilled to learn something this week on the, the Writer's Room. Professor Ernie Bailey from the UK Gluck Center's Research Center. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. Great to have you. And so you guys have been in the news a little bit recently because at the end of June, you released the first part of the, re the results of the geneticism study and the, the study of thoroughbred genetics. And it's a big, obviously, a topic, hot topic in racing because there was the pr proposed 140 mare cap for stallions. And the concern behind that was supposedly that we're weakening the breed and it's becoming less diverse, the thoroughbred genes over time. You guys found that at least through part one, that that's not the case. Can you talk about the research that you undertook and the conclusions that you came to? Sure. The I mean, the, the premise for the study w was the, the back talk about diversity. Um, thoroughbreds have been selected for 300 years. There's been a small population that started from. And so people are justifiably concerned that um, maybe diversity is being bred out. Um, the tools that we've had to look at that have been incomplete. We've used blood groups, we've used biochemical markers, microsatellite DNA, and lately SNP markers, and, and all of those markers sample a small part of the genome. Um, the best one that we've got is picking up 0.02% of the genome. And we now have a really great tool. We can do whole genome sequencing. We can sequence every single base, every single piece of DNA in, in a horse. And so we that's the really... <laughs> that's the complete assessment of diversity that one can do. And so we thought that with all these questions that were circulating around, why don't we use this particular tool? Um, the costs of doing sequencing have been dropping precipitously over the last 10 years. It's just come to the point where it is feasible for us in research to, to do that. So I got three colleagues, um, two other colleagues, Ted Kelbfleisch here at the University of Kentucky and Jessica Peterson at um, Univer University of Nebraska. And the three of us set out to sequence 100 thoroughbred horses to assess the diversity that exists. And the way that we did that was we, we went out and um, solicited samples from over 1,000 thoroughbred horses. Um, and the breeders were, were very responsive, very helpful for that. From that, we looked at the pedigree, so we picked the 100 horses amongst the 1,000 that, that appeared to be the most diverse. And our goal was really to capture all, all of the common genetic variants that exist in the thoroughbred and a lot of the, the variants that are fairly rare, less than half of a percent. So, so that was our goal, was to basically get a snapshot today of what the thoroughbred looks like. Um, the results that we had were um, interesting. The, we are, we're not the first to have done this. There are two other studies that have done it before. This is the largest study that's done it. And all of us have found that there's considerable genetic diversity in the thoroughbred. Um, the other laboratories have sequenced horses of a variety of different breeds, um, warm bloods, quarter horses, Andalusians. And when you look at the diversity that exists in these different breeds, we find that the thoroughbred, the diversity in the thoroughbred overlaps that. Um, this means that the thoroughbred breeders have done a good job over 300 years of, of continuing to maintain the diversity in the breed. Um, that's not to say that there isn't a decrease when breeders are selecting for horses, inbreeding is a constant part of it. And so inbreeding is going to gradually increase over time. And so what we want to do is to be in a position to monitor the changes in, in the uh, genetic diversity. Uh, Ernie, thanks for that explanation. and. You know, you know the debate on one side led by the jockey club are saying that there is a problem here and we need to limit the, the size of the books uh, that a stallion is bred to 140. The other side led by some of the big stud farms say that's not right, there's no problem here and you can't limit our business. So far as answering that question, whether limiting the book to 140 is a good idea, really not necessary or maybe, you know, something else, how would you answer that question after the study? There isn't any... Um, academic information that says 140 is a magic number as to um, um, protecting the integrity of the breed. Um, I'm not sure where the number came from. Um, and it's one of the things that we would like to do is to be able to uh, look at the diversity, model the breeding, and, and, and make a recommendation as to what is the proper approach. 
I'm, I'm somewhat personally skeptical that 140 is, is an issue. Um, there is, as, a, as this study has shown, a lot of genetic diversity that exists in the thoroughbred. It's common sense that if you reduce the number of, of stallions that you use, that you would restrict diversity, you would restrict inbreeding. But the study that we did shows that there's a lot of genetic diversity. And so this is a really small effect. There's, there's perhaps 100,000 mares that exist, brood mares that are out there, and they basically contain most of the diversity that exists in the thoroughbred. And so it's, it's likely that the restricting the, the book size um, for a small number of stallions is going to have a very minimal effect. It would be a bit like trying to turn a tanker around, an, a, an oil tanker around in the middle of the ocean. If you have a... Uh, a uh, rowboat that is pushing on the bow, you're not going to have a, a very large effect on it. Um, I, I don't know what the answer is. I'm skeptical about 140, but I think that when we have the numbers about the diversity, we can then model and make a prediction of here is the best way to manage it. And it may not be restricting the book, and it may not be a matter of making changes now. Uh, you know, the real question that exists is there's a lot of diversity today. Um, we are continuing to inbreed the horse, that is part of improvement. You're trying to get rid of the bad genes and you're trying to concentrate the good genes. This is a good thing. Inbreeding you know, can be beneficial, but at some point we don't want the horse to become a clone. And when will this happen? Is it gonna be in 20 years or in 60 years or in a hundred years? And we can use modeling to do that and, and, and uh, give advice to breeders um, based on these real numbers. That, that's, a, that's a great answer, Dr. Bailey. You know, as, as somebody who's been very outspoken against the 140 mare cap, I'm glad that there's some genuine science behind that stance. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I think the reason why they came up with the 140 mare number had to do with a study of standard breads that was, um, that was done, you know, by the standard bread industry. Um, and again, I think our understanding is that thoroughbreds have a lot more genetic um, uh, diversity than, than the standard breads do. But I think that's where they came up with the original 140 number. Um, when, when you, when you look at the way that people are breeding mares to certain stallions, um, you know, a lot of breeders are doing it based on what the hypothetical mating grade is. Okay. I'm sure you're familiar with, with those, you know, with, with, with those ratings and NICs and, and those programs. Could you tell our audience a little bit about if it makes sense or if it's not enough, you know, information to make a huge investment based on, on a, on a, you know, on a work Nick or on a, on a true Nick grade. <laughs> you're, you're getting outside of our, our area of expertise. I mean, we, you know, academics, we require having huge amounts of information in order to make decisions. And, and I'm somewhat, um, I admire breeders because they have much more limited information and they're making these choices and making the plans, um, they have very special skills that are, are quite different from what we're doing. For me to do the same thing, I would have to have 100 times more information than the breeders are doing. So I, I admire what they do. I, I have no, no comment about it. It falls outside of my, uh, my expertise. Dr. Bailey, I asked this, I, I mentioned this in my first question, that this, this was part one of the UK Galactic Center study and part two is coming up. Can you talk about how part two will differ from part one, how it'll pick up on the same research and kind of what you're trying to find out in part two. Well, the, the, what we had, had reported earlier was simply the numbers because we, we had just gotten the sequences. Uh, it was quite exciting to see the extent of diversity. It uh, matched that in previous studies. And so that, that was the information. It was simply the raw number of, uh, of, um, of uh, genetic variants that we found. What we're hoping to do is to publish a, a complete paper this fall, and it will include um, looking at some of the structural variants because in the genome there are inversions, there's copy number variants, there's a number of different types of variation that exist. Um, we want to look at, uh, there are measures of inbreeding that are called regions of homozygosity. And while breeders look at the pedigrees and they can calculate inbreeding from that, we can look at the DNA and ask how many regions of the DNA are actually um, showing this type of homozygosity. So it, it's, um, a lot of it is pretty wonky, but, but we're hoping that it will, will uh, provide a, uh, uh, a nice picture of the thoroughbred genome today, the status of diversity. And we can use that, say, five years, 10 years from now to, to assess, 
you know, what changes have come about. I mean, one of the problems that exists right now is we don't have a standard from 10 years ago or 20 years or 30 years ago. This technology is quite new. And so um, we could go back and look at 40 years ago blood groups, but uh, we don't do blood groups anymore and they are fairly limited. So this, I think, is going to be the standard going forward. Uh, Ernie, thank you for not being too wonky. I think you've done a real good job of explaining this to the layman. <laughs> but let's go right back to the very basics of this. Um, we keep throwing this word around diversity. And, you know, we talk about it being important. But why is diversity in, in, a, in, in a breed so important? Well, I mean, diversity is the raw material that the breeders are using for, for, for getting the performance. Um, there's probably different ways to have a successful racehorse. I mean, there are, are tall horses and short horses and distance horses and, and um, sprinters. And so the breeder is taking, a, a, has a palette. I mean, there isn't a perfect genome that exists, but there's a palette of colors that the breeder is using in order to, to uh, uh, try to create or choose a, a, a valuable racehorse. And the diversity is responsible for that. Uh, and I don't want to overemphasize that because what we know about genetics is that the genetics is ha, plays a significant role, but after that, the management and the, the trainer are, are hugely important. But the starting point really is this palette of colors that you use, and that is the diversity that exists. Um, the, the other issue is that diversity is also important for, for health. And we know from looking at uh, um, some small wild populations where the numbers of individuals get down, they lose genetic diversity, um, they lose the ability, their immune systems become uh, more restricted. They're less able to respond to, to um, infectious diseases, to pathogens because of that loss of diversity. So we want to maintain diversity in order to maintain the health as well. And, and I think there's a third aspect, which is suppose a novel um, uh, pathogen comes in. We've just experienced it with COVID-19. Uh, COVID-19 wasn't as, um, um, didn't wipe out the population, fortunately, but say something comes in that had a, a serious uh, um, uh, high level of mortality in the population. Uh, it's the genetic diversity, we hope, that will protect the population from being wiped out. And that's not something I think that we, we, we want to see with the uh, thoroughbred, but that, that is another aspect is to have the diversity. Say, say a pathogen comes through a, through a barn, um, some of the horses will become ill, some of the horses will resist it. The horses that resist it are barriers to transferring the, the disease further on. So it's important at the population level for diversity to exist. Okay. Dr. Bailey, if, if you will, I have two questions for you. Um, the, the first one is, you know, you walk around the sales and people talk about, well, I'll only buy a daughter of Bernardini or only by a gray tappet. And, and, you know, they feel like that there's a genetic reason why, even though it's probably anecdotal. Can you tell the audience if, if there's really racing potential that can be linked to sex or color? We, I mean, I, I, I'm not a breeder, but I mean, at this point we have looked and tried to find evidence for that. And, and we've not, I mean, in terms of sex, um, there is a sexual dimorphism in horses, as in most mammals, where males tend to be larger and uh, uh, more muscular, and so they, they, they may perform well. And so we, we, we see this in horse racing because there are races that are, are restricted to females and races that are predominantly males. Um, color, nobody's found any, any association of color. And the thing is, we, what we know now about genetics is that there is a... There, <laughs> There will be a single base change that will alter the binding of a uh, of a, uh, of a of a receptor that re leads to the production of a, a melanin. It's hard to imagine how that has anything to do with with uh, racing prowess. Great. No, that, that, I I appreciate that. And my my final question to you is, you know, with all the genetic studies that you're doing, and and I know that that genetics is an ongoing, um, you know, and 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 you know, fluid kind of science. Are we in our lifetime going to get to the point where we can see cloning in thoroughbreds? Like if somebody has a, a hair of secretariat that they'll be able to, you know, basically regenerate, uh, for lack of a better term, another secretariat? You know, the thing the thing that made secretariat a great racehorse was, was a variety of things. And one of them certainly was his genetics, you know, that were unique. Uh, another was management. Another was uh, was, um, um, you know, the training. Um, 
<laughs> at a meeting once there was a uh, there was a farm manager who came up to me. It was just after someone had come through and just said uh, genetics is only 30 percent of the uh, of the performance of a racehorse. Uh, management is 60 percent. So don't worry about the genetics. And so I was kind of discouraged. I'm a geneticist. You know, I'm, I wanted to champion genetics. And this guy came up to me and I was walking out. My head was kind of down because the speaker had, had kind of dissed my my discipline. This, the breeder came up and he just said, you know, uh, tell me about this genetics. I'm really fascinated with it. I said, why do you want to know? Why do you want to know? Because because the guy just said there it wasn't important. He says, no, no, I'm the manager. I do everything perfect. The management, the training, all of that, I control and it is perfect. The only thing out of my control is the genetics. So I've got to know more about the genetics. So you come back to what are the things that are out there? So you've got genetics, you've got the management, you've got the training, but there's one other thing. You know, even if you cloned uh, secretariat and had all the same training procedures, we don't know in development um, what events happened, you know. For a mu particular muscle cell, how many times did it divide? How far did a neuron migrate in the, in, and so on? These are, are things that are random, truly random events. And the thing that happened with Secretariat was that he was the best example of his genetics. He was the best example of his training. So if you had a race and you had 10 Secretariats that were running, the original would be the one that would win. I have no doubt about that because he was truly unique. And many of the things were outside of our our understanding. John's trying to create the new Jurassic Park of old retired Hall of Fame thoroughbreds, it sounds like. Yeah. So last question for me, and this is more of a conceptual question because there's been a lot of talk recently about how infre infrequently horses run these days. And I think a lot of it is training <laughs> methods, but there is a school of thought in racing that it's because we're selecting horses who have not run as often to become stallions. They're not as sturdy. They don't have the longevity that previous stallions had. And it goes to, for mares as well, but not as much as stallions. Not asking you to comment on whether that's happening and that's weakening the breed, but conceptually, is that a possibility? Is that something that could happen over time where you pick horses that don't run as frequently and you breed them and then the progeny don't run as frequently and that could just kind of snowballs? Is that possible? There, there are, there, I just come from a uh, Havermeyer horse genome workshop and a number of people are, are actively investigating. I mean, that, that is a real question, but we don't know the answer to that. But that, that is a reasonable thing. And there are studies underway. And I encourage people that if they, they are invited to participate in them to, to do so. Um, the scientists, when, the, when they do these studies, the information is, is, is kept confidential. That is really a standard in science. And we, uh, um, there have been regrettable instances where the names of horses have been published in studies and we have, have punished our colleagues that have done that. But we have a standard really of keeping the information anonymous uh, when it comes out. But that that is something that we would like to handle. You know, one of the things, the thoroughbred is really an amazing athlete. He is an amazing athlete. And, and that is one of the things that brings people to the racetrack to see them. I mean, we like to see uh, Olympians. We like to see Football players like to see basketball players and great racehorses because they are just exceptional individuals. And, and I think that, that when you disparage the, the breed and you disparage the genetics of the breed, you're going to discourage um, uh, racing enth enthusiasts from, from participating. And so I, I think we need to find out. I think we need to ask real questions and I think we need to have real data to back up you know, the claims as to what's going on. So I'd like to know, you know, are our horses becoming genetically unsound? What can we do about it? All right, Dr. Bailey, thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate the work you guys are doing. It's so important, especially in this hot debate about, you know, stallions, you know, mare caps and geneticism. You guys are doing great work. Thanks so much for the time and explaining it to us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Great to talk to you. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, Dr. Ernie Bailey will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more at greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. Why do the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select the Green Group as their tax advisor? We simply save them money and know how to make them more successful. Over the past 40 years, founder Leonard Green has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport. His in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made the Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website 
website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. TDN Writers Room is brought to you by XBTV. This week's XBTV Workout of the Week, which you can see on the screen right now, is Mo Strike, who worked four furlongs and 49.65 at Saratoga on Sunday. Brad Cox trained Sanford winner. is now pointing towards the September 5th hopeful stakes. Got to think he's one of the main contenders for that. And the XBTV Workout's always a great resource for the Saratoga and Del Mar meets, so Flightline getting back on the work tab and, and really stepping it up for the Pacific Classic coming up. Got all those two-year-old works, all those stakes works. Go check out XBTV if you're watching Saratoga or Del Mar at all this summer. Helps out from a handicapping perspective, really helps you get the jump on some of those babies we're going to get to see in the second half of the meet. Everybody ready for the re- weekend preview segment, which is now sponsored. We are now sponsored by Three Chimneys for the weekend preview segment. So hit the hat tip to Three Chimneys. A lot of exciting things going on over there that we're going to talk about in just a little bit. But we have, you know, we have some action at Saratoga that we're going to get to. We're going to have some action at Del Mar that we might get to. But the big action this weekend in the middle of August is that Churchill Downs. I almost forgot about this until I saw the PPs and the entries come out. Saturday, Saturday they're going to run the Arlington Million and the Beverly D. At Churchill Downs, obviously, those were here before run at Arlington Park, and we all miss Arlington already. And I don't I want to give Churchill too much credit because they are taking the, the, the wrecking ball to Arlington Park. But it's at least nice that they're keeping up the tradition of these races and, and picking out a day on the calendar to run them. Um, those, those are going to be the two grade ones. Saturday at Churchill is an 11 race card. Uh, the Arlington Million, not all that interesting. I think it, the interesting part is smooth like straight who's going to have to stretch out a little bit to a mile and an eighth. Uh, it's not a mile and a quarter anymore because Churchill can't run a mile and a quarter turf races. Santan, who won the turf classic earlier this year at Churchill, is back in this race. Uh, so he, he it's a little bit interesting. Beverly D is a short field, five-horse field. But the, the subplot of all of this, unfortunately, I think, is the Churchill turf course. Because they haven't run any turf races at Churchill since June. Now, they were supposed to run races, it was like early in June too. They were supposed to run races on the July 4th weekend on the turf. They had to cancel those. They had to cancel turf racing for several weeks at Churchill because there were problems with this new turf course. It's a brand new turf course uh, that, that was built over the off season that they debuted this year at the Churchill Spring Meet. So fingers crossed, you know, for safe racing and all that. And I just, I, it's, I, I've never really, I've seen this scenario or, or thought of this scenario where, there hadn't been turf racing for months, and you come back for one day and run two grade ones on it. It's a little bit scary, but hopefully they've gotten the the, the issues you know worked out, and you know turf racing can be back full time in the fall at Churchill. But any any thoughts from you guys on the Arlington Million or the Bev D? Yeah, a couple of things. And Joe, I agree with you. I mean, Churchill is the outfit that everybody loves to hate. They didn't have to do this. And I do think they deserve some credit. And, you know, I'm trying to think why, you know, it seems everything they do is just bottom line oriented. I don't know how they're going to make any extra money off this or anything like this. They're paying out the big purses, Um, you you know, but on the other side of the coin, these fields for the Arlington Million and Beverly D are not particularly strong. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Only five in the Beverly D, the Arlington Million, you got a few more, but uh, between the two races, only one foreign runner, Aiden O'Brien brings in a horse for the Beverly D, and not a single foreign horse in the Arlington Million. So I'm wondering if some trainers were a little bit hesitant that, you know, okay, we're uncertain about the turf course at Churchill, let's pick another spot. I also think the mile and eighth might have hurt them a little bit too, because at a, the mile and a quarter versus a mile and eighth are two very different races. And the mile and eighth is now going up against the four star Dave at a mile on the turf at Saratoga. So I, I, I think that that's part of the equation in here. But, um, you know, hopefully, uh, and, you know, I don't think there's any reason to believe that it won't be a, a safe day of racing. The turf course won't, won't hold up. But it's also, I don't think you mentioned, Joe, the fact that there were uh, two other turf stakes on the card, uh, the Secretariat. And another one, I don't remember the name of the other one, that they actually canceled. So they're not going to take a chance to run more than the two. 
Um, you know, not great fields, not races that you're getting too excited for. But yes, it's good to see the Arlington Million and the Beverly D still out there and that tradition is being upheld. I think that when these races run, uh, there's going to be a lot of people holding their breath for that minute and 50 seconds each that, that these races are because they're going to be holding their breath, hoping that every single horse that runs, uh, you know, finishes safely, uh, more so than they're hoping for an exciting finish. You're right, Bill. They don't have to do this. And, and it's really weird the way that they set it up to have basically this this short meet. Um, and I know people usually love these boutique days and, and boutique weekends and everything like that. But I just don't know how it's going to be received. I'm, I'm glad that Churchill Downs is honoring the fact that they're running these two grade one races because grade one races are still grade ones. And they're, they're really difficult to get back once you lose that status. Um, but when I went through the, 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 the PPs, yeah, I was disappointed also. It, it's just not a, a great field. And then I went back to look, you know, historically at, at the last couple of Arlington Millions. And, and guys, this is my humble opinion, but those races, this race hasn't been that great for a while. Um, I mean, Bricks and Mortar won it in 19, but I'd be hard pressed for either of you to name a winner in the past five, uh, you know, uh, Arlington Millions, unless you bet on them. It, it's just, a, it's not that great of a field. You don't look back on this race in particular when come Breeders' Cup time and say, who won the Arlington Million? Because that's a key race. So th this race has really lost its luster, um, you know, as far as entries for, for a long time. And I'm just wondering if Churchill is holding on to it with the hopes that they're going to be able to reconfigure it and repackage it and make it a, a, a different kind of race and, and a more spectacular race, either, you know, earlier in the year, maybe when they have their usual meet um, or, or, or something, because it, it's just these two races in particular have lost their their luster um, and their excitement, um, you know, at least from a, you know, from a, a, a betting and from an owner standpoint. Yeah. Well, and also I, I'm interested to see what kind of handle they get on the card, because like I said, I'm sure I'm not the only person who forgot that these races were being run at Churchill in the, the middle of the summer and they're going up against Saratoga. You know, Arlington usually had pretty good handle on that card, but, you know, Arlington was a, a track that got a lot of great on-track handle as well, which I don't think Churchill is necessarily going to have this Saturday. Uh, you guys are right, and then Bill makes a good point that at a mile and an eighth, it's it's competing a lot more with the four-star Dave than it would have been, it, you know, if it were still at a mile and a quarter. Maybe, like, maybe in the fall, maybe if they want to, like, go up against the Joe Hirsch or something, because – also now, you know, Kentucky Downs is not that far away. We're only about three weeks away from Kentucky Downs. So I think that those races have become more marquee races on the calendar that, you know, people might be overlooking. Even though these are, these are grade ones, they might be overlooking these spots for the, the big purses at Kentucky Downs. And, yeah, it's, a uh, you know, like you guys are saying, on the one hand, it's nice to see the, the tradition of these races kept up. But on the other hand, middle of August, mile and eighth, Arlington Million, where Smooth Like Straight is going to be the favorite. Don't know that that's going to get it done going forward, and it's going to be worth keeping these races at least on this part of the calendar. So we're gonna we're gonna take a quick break and toss the three chimneys out, and we're gonna come back and talk a little bit of, of the Saratoga races because we got the four star day and the Saratoga special Saturday, and it's, uh, I'll, I'll be there. It should be a great day of racing. Um, but you know, I, three chimneys in a, in a very interesting and great spot right now. They have the number one right now, first crop and second crop sires, which is not. Often, especially for three champions, obviously, it's not a small operation, but compared to some of the other gigantic international operations, they're not quite at that size. So for them to have the, the top two sires in the last two craps, at least right now, is pretty amazing. We're going to talk about Shah Ras Tech after, after the break because he's been a revelation. But Gunrunner, obviously, has been the revelation of the past year plus. We saw it last night, the $2.3 million Gunrunner call. Everybody is jumping in to get a piece of Gunrunner. It, it was uh, reported last week that Cyberknife's. Uh, stallion rights have been sold to Spendthrift, so the, the stallion farms are already trying to get in on the ground floor of those Gunrunner Grade One winners. Who's going to stand the first Grade One winner by Gunrunner? And uh, John, I, you know, you're you're a breeding and sales guy. I, I, I'm hesitant to to think of a, a horse that's gotten off to this kind of start in recent years. You know, obviously American Pharaoh and Justify have had great starts for Cool More. I think of Nyquist a little bit, although he's kind of I'm not going to say fizzled out, but he's come down a little bit from that big high. When's, who's the last horse you saw, John, that was, came out this strong in their first two craps? Boy, that'd be really hard to, to to come up with one. I mean, you can say maybe American Pharaoh, but American Pharaoh is because he came out so strong with his first crop and his second crop just wasn't up to that level. Um, but was still a very good, you know, a very good group. He's the first one that kind of comes to mind when you talk about the first two crops hitting the ground running like the way Gunrunner is. But, uh, you know, just the fact that 
that, and Joe, you weren't here on that one show when we were talking about the Haskell, but the fact that it was a gun runner exacta and three of the top four horses that finished were, were gun runners. And, and, uh, you know, Gnight who won the, the grade two Amsterdam, um, you know, with, within the same week, it was, it was just, it was amazing that that gun runner had so many, um, horses that were not only running in the big races, but hitting the board in the big races and, and winning the big races. Um, so it, it, it's been a little bit of a surprise, I think, for most people in the industry. I mean, look, the horse stood for $75,000 his first crop for a reason, because he was a great runner, um, son of Candy Ride, and had confirmation out the wazoo. I mean, he's very well conformed. So it wasn't that he was a superstar surprise um, that his horses are running this well. But I think, you know, to, to a person in, in the breeding industry, if you said to them, um, is Gun Runner going to have the success, the initial success that he's been having? I don't think people would have expected that his foals would have been this precocious, number one, and that they would uh, continue to run in all these grade one uh, races and, and grade two races and just be astonishing. And that's why he had two yearlings that sold for seven figures, because his foals are proven to be runners. Albeit, you know, I probably had the only gun runner that I can't run. But, but, that, but that's, you know, that's no big deal. But but the, the main thing is, don't focus on me, please. The main thing is that gun runners are running all over the place. Um, and we couldn't even get a gun runner season for our mare population last year. That's how strong of a first crop group he had. Yeah, I mean, and just you're looking at the numbers. I'm looking at the TD and Sire list now, the second crop runners. He's got nine black, black type winners. The next closest one, I, I believe, has five. Um, which is a classic empire. Shout out to, to Cool Mark for classic empire. But he's got nine black type winners, twenty black type horses, five grade stakes winners, fourteen grade stakes horses, three grade one winners, and four grade one stakes horses. Which is just it's it's mind boggling that he's that far ahead of his of his uh, intake right now. So we'll be right back, and we're going to talk a little bit about Sharp Has Tech after this message from Three Chimneys. Here comes Tama. Tama in the center of the track with good looking stride. Squares off with Cyberknife. Cyberknife takes the lead. Tama going with him. These two in a thriller. Cyberknife just in front. And Cyberknife has won the TVG.com Haskell over Tama. Jack Christopher finished third. The running time, 1 minute 46.24 seconds. Good runners on top of the world. Come dream with us at Three Chimneys. And it's all Tyler's tribe to the final furlong. He's putting on another show tonight. He is eight lengths in front. Now it's 10, now it's 12. Tyler's tribe pouring it on as they come down to the line. He's gonna win by double digits and he stops the clock in 104. I mentioned before the break that Three Chimneys has the, has the top first crop and second crop sires right now, which is a remarkable accomplishment. It's obviously early in the first crop season, but you know, Sharp Azteca is kind of lapping the field the way that Gunrunner is lapping the field with his first and second crop runners. Sharp Azteca has 16 winners so far in his freshman season. There's a lot of stallions that don't even have 16 starters yet on the track. Uh, he's seven ahead of the next uh, horse on the list, which is Bolt Doro with nine. So he has been a revelation, especially for a horse who only stands for $5,000 right now. I'm sure that fee is going to go up just based on what he's done so far. And especially as we get later in the year and these horses start running in grade one races, they're just going to make him even more and more valuable. And I like Sharp Azteca for one particular reason, son of Freud. I love having that New York breeding influence continue because Freud has been a terrific New York sire and, and sire of, of New York bred. So He's like I said, he's been a revelation at only five thousand dollars at three chimneys. So get in while well, you can now with Sharp Azteca because if his horses keep running like this, that fee is going to double, triple, quadruple, quintuple. You know the deal. It's 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 definitely the time to get in. Um, so we we got a couple other races to mention. Not a gigantic week, weekend of racing in Saratoga, but we do have two graded stakes. We got the Grade One Four Star Dave and the Grade Two Saratoga Special. Looks like a, a, a nice weekend of racing overall. Four Star Dave looks like it's going to get a pretty short field. Um, we got Got Smoking in there. It looks like Casa Creed. Looks like Regal Glory might try the boys in the Four Star Dave. We don't have the entries just yet, but trying to follow in the footsteps of Got Stormy last year, and you know she's obviously has has put her name in the record books with her Four Star Dave heroics. Uh, so it looks like we're going to have about six horse field over under. Whether Chad Chad is going to have more than three of the six horses in there. 
And then in the Saratoga special, we're probably going to have a short field also, but that's because of the presence of Gulfport, who, and there's been a lot of nice two-year-olds who have run so far this year, but I have yet to see a race that measures up the Gulfport's win, and as John would say, the bashful manor, manor stakes, where he ran off and won by a dozen lengths in a total canter, and he's just a super, super powerful looking horse. Uh, son of Uncle Mo, I believe, from the friends at Coolmore. And I'm really looking forward to seeing him. I don't think it's going to be a great betting race because he's going to be one to five or two to five or thereabouts. But I'm really looking forward to seeing him on the track. Anything else from you guys on the on the Saratoga races? Yeah, uh, first of all, believe it or not, Chad Brown has never won the Four Star Dave. Can you imagine a grade one turf stakes race in New York? He's never won it. But he's going after it with Regal Glory, the Philly, and on the uh, boys in there. And uh, Mr. Cassie sure proved that that's done, can be done. Uh, got Stormy won this race twice uh, in, in recent mm-hmm. years for that. And I want to um, on Gulfport, um, let's look at you. Uh, he won by 12 and a quarter lengths and must be a superstar because in that race was no other than stay on the good side. John? That's exactly right. I, we, we can honestly say that we were one of the horses that got trounced by, by that superstar. <laughs> it was an honor. It was an honor to be trapped. It was an honor and privilege. I, all I can tell you is that the Gulfport has the best hind end quarters that I've ever seen because I've seen a lot of it. That being said, guys, I, you, you guys touched on on all the important parts of the races, but you know, you mentioned Chad Brown and 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 you know, this is a stake race, the four star Dave that, that he hasn't won. How about it? Looks like he's only going to have one horse in that race, and there's you know, there's two great ones at, at Churchill. Uh, that we just talked about, and he's only got one entry in that in, in in one of those two races too. Where the hell are all Chad's you know good turf horses? Why aren't they running in the Beverly D? And why doesn't he have more than one horse in the Arlington Million? And how come he's only going to have one horse in the Four Star Day? For the love of God, man, where are his turf horses? I mean, he ran one, two, three, four at the Diana a couple of weeks ago. I think he might have two in the Four Star Day. But I think he's going to have Masson in there too, one the, the Forbidden Apple, but maybe not. I'm just looking at the probables uh, right now, but I. I John, I think Chad's going to be all right. You know, it's just oh, a yeah, no of course he's going to be all right. But here's here's a guy that really controls that that sector of of racing. Um, well, and also, and- but his thing is, uh, I feel like more turf fillies and mares than the boys. So he's got yeah, he's got nothing in the Beverly D. Yep. Yeah. Which Chad step surprising. it up? You hear you heard it from John Green. Chad, step it up. You're slacking. You know, you're he falling off. In the Beverly John D. Green said it. John, he does have mm-hmm. Rougier in the Beverly D. Which is okay. his he's got the one. 11th okay, best go. Philly he's, mayor. He's got the one. Force. He's got the one. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I know. That's that is that is the truth. That is the truth. I was interested to see that in the Beverly D. There was a three year old Philly that's coming over that you know Brian's bringing yes. over actually. Really fun. Um, yeah, which is which is interesting also. But anyway, we we're, we've already talked about those races at nauseum. Anyway, come on, Chad. Where are those runners? We want to see. We want to see. If we want to see you in the winter circle, buddy. That's it. We'd like to see your smiling face in the winter circle. Tough crowd. Tough crowd. The guy's got like 30 winners already at the Saratoga meet, but yeah. I'm not criticizing him. I'm just asking. I don't want to have my my California uh, you know, license revoked. <laughs> the TDN Writers Room is brought to you by West Point Thoroughbreds. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership involves you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. You can learn more at West Point TV. Dot com. West Point was busy at the face of Saratoga sale. That's an understatement. Coming home with three yearlings, including the full sister to their greatest stakes winner, first captain for $2 million and the day one session topping Uncle Mo Colt that brought $1.5 million. Huge weekend for West Point two-year-olds as well. Last weekend, three winners and a close second from four starters. First winner of the day, Battle of Normandy was really impressive. Uh, you know, she, she looked really good for Shug McGahey and the, the opener on, on Whitney Day. Looked very, very strong. At Ellis, Jace's Rogue got the win and earned a TDN Rising Star honor. He's trained by Brad Cox, owned by West Point in partnership with the Albaugh family. And finally, Perfect Prank by Ashford Sire Practical Joke broke his maiden at Horseshoe, Indianapolis. So the West Point two-year-olds showing up and showing out all over the country, as you would expect. I think that's, that, that two-year-old success is only going to ramp up as we get later in the summer and into the fall. So we'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds. All the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. 
West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. Being a small family business, I guess we're part of a dying breed. We're really grateful for the people that entrust us. We know it's a huge responsibility. We're always with your horse every step of the way. When it comes to being at the sales ground, showing your horses, we are with your horse. Just driving up down the road every day, there's not a time that I don't look out and feel a responsibility to the sport, the animal, the people that come to invest in the game. I want to see as many people enjoy this sport as they possibly can because we do have the most beautiful sport in the world. TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Legacy Bloodstock. If you think that 50 years combined experience in the horse business could benefit your program, give Tommy or Wendy a call. They personally advise on each horse as if they were their own. Legacy graduate Sharp as a Tech, who I mentioned you know, in the Sharp as Tech a bit, should have mentioned him specifically because he looked very, very good winning the Tyro recently for Doug O'Neill. He owns the highest two-year-old turf fire speed figure of 20, 2022, scoring an 85 in that Troy win at Monmouth. He'll be pointing towards the $500,000 juvenile sprint at Kentucky Downs on September 8th, while his yearling half-sister prepares to sell with Legacy at Keeneland September. Obviously, yearling sale season is in full swing right now. So go hit up Tommy or Wendy. They'll take good care of you. Joe, can I just add in that they have a really interesting-looking Baltimore cult near in the New York Red Sale coming up, hit 571, who is a, a son of a, a stake-winning unbridled song mare and a half to two other stake horses. Um, and, and again, a New York bred to boot. So Bolt Dioro, another up and coming young sire and, and uh, out of a, just a black type female family. So I wish Legacy uh, and their clients the best with that Bolt Dioro uh, New York bred hit 571. You hear that, people? John Green is on it. John Green is on that horse and you know how he likes to take it to the mat. So mm-hmm. definitely go take a, take a peek at that horse on the sales grounds with Legacy. This week's Remy cartoon. I feel like these are getting better every single week. And I'm not going to take all the credit that he knows he has to step up his game because the cartoons are going to be shown on the preeminent racing podcast in America. But I love this one, especially this week from Remy. It's a it's a rich woman in the back of a limousine with the champagne bubbling and a really n- nice setup that says, Driver, take me shopping. The usual Saks, Bergdorf, and Facing Tipton. That's what it was like last night. You know, all, all of the, the glitterati were out last night. And throwing down crazy sums of money, it was it was a, an incredible night, and we're, we're looking forward to that continuing later this year at Keeneland in September. All right, so with that, that's going to do it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. Don't forget that Keeneland September sale starts Monday, September 12th. Catalog is now live with 4,147 yearlings. You can check it out at the world's yearling sale. Com. I want to thank Bill Finley, John Green, our Green Group guest of the week, Ernie Bailey, our producer, Patty Wolf, our associate producer, Katie Petruniak, and our editors, Anthony LaRocca, Aliyah LaRocca, Nathan Wilkinson. Thank you so much for watching. Maybe see some of you at Saratoga this weekend, and we'll see you next week on the show.